We only have 45 minutes for this session, so my suggestion is that you each share with us for five minutes a snapshot of your successes and best practices regarding gender challenges, and then I will open up the debate to the audience. Dr. Foley, would you like to start? Do we have a mic? You have a mic. Perfect. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Science Impact for organizing the conference and my uh, college for supporting me and the, my panelists here as well who are esteemed in, and come from various uh, programs that uh, we'll all hear from soon. Um, I'd like to contextualize uh, my efforts at Suffolk County Community College uh, and explain to you in that context the confluence of a lot of programs and initiatives, many of them grant-based, which have led to some successful outcomes that we are hoping will make a difference in gender equity. Um, Suffolk County Community College is based on Long Island in New York. We're about 50 miles outside of New York City, which is about 30 kilometers. We are a three-campus institution. Uh, we are the largest community college in the state of New York. We are part of the State University of New York system called SUNY, which is comprised of 62 colleges and universities and 30 community colleges. We educate annually 26,000 students. Um, in terms of that and understanding that Suffolk County Community College is a two-year institution, uh, we are articulative within SUNY, the State University of New York Public, for our first two years of education. So we have students in STEM who come to us not because they are academically challenged, it's because they are economically challenged. We are affordable. Our cost of tuition is about $4,200 a year. And they can take their first two years of STEM credits and then transfer to a four-year institution and continue on, which is what we've been doing with them for the programs that I've been working with for over 15 years. So over half of all undergraduates in the United States begin their higher education at community colleges. More than two-thirds of community college students who declare a STEM major don't complete that degree, according to the National Center for Educational Statistics. In 2016, community college students made up 49% of all undergraduates and 43% of first-year students, including those who went on to pursue STEM careers. And studies have indicated, and that's what we've been finding in our research, that the importance of early student research is imperative to students' persistence. We're changing in the United States with demographics. Women and immigrants make up an increasing percent of the United States workforce. So undergraduate research opportunities that attract and retain community college students in STEM fields are crucial to the country's economic success and our global competitiveness. Um, there's a strong correlation between undergraduate research opportunities and persistence. However, UNESCO data in 2015 indicates that only 25%, excuse me, 28% of researchers around the globe are women. Equal numbers of men and women pursue bachelor's and master's degrees in STEM fields, and the loss of women from research careers begins at the PhD stage. So since 50% of university students begin their education at community colleges, we are focusing that on our research opportunities for these young women to become commonplace. So two years we have them, they begin in freshman, and at most, in most, I am a chemist by trade, uh, you don't usually in an ACS certified degree program start and do a research until your senior year, it's a capstone experience. However, what we've been doing for the past 15 years is, is encompassing and involving a, a large amount of federal grant programs and a large amount of programmatic initiatives that start these students on their re the research career track after what would be their freshman year. So I'll explain more about that later. So we're going to leverage we leverage in conf the confluence of, we have nine grants so far in the 15 years I've been involved in doing this. I'm the STEM coordinator on all three campuses, and I also am the STEM liaison to the State University of New York system, which I report to the provost in Albany, New York. Um, I also work with the National Science Foundation in Washington, DC. So as such, I've been the PI for seven of our nine federal grants. We have seven NSF National Science Foundation grants. We have a National Institute of Health grant. And we have um, a Helmsley, Leona and Harry Helmsley Foundation grant. And we are working on a pending grant initiative, um, hopefully in, uh, in September. However, as other people have spoken, the grant 
agency for federal grants right now, and the administration is iffy. Um, so the partnerships and the mentoring relationships for developing these type of opportunities for young women is, is crucial to what I would like to share. Um, what is our ecosystem? We have a scaffolded approach that we utilize at the community college for mentoring and, uh, young women. The programmatic elements include money. Okay, The three grants that I have in, in succession are called science, uh, STEM grants. They're scholarships for science, technology, engineering, and math. And to date, we've provided over $2 million worth of scholarship money in a decade for students to come to the community college to start their STEM careers. What does this do? It, the scholarships are based on GPA. We provide a one-on-one -on -one discipline specific mentor. We have monthly meetings to have speakers who come in that look like these young women and men, it's, it's open to both, but um, we predominantly invite women in leadership positions within government, within policy making, within uh, transfer schools and programs, so that these young women can see, and, and diversity elements as well, women of color, so that they can see people who look like them in positions of power. Also what we do is we invite our alumni who are Later on, I'll explain to you some of the, the very nice, um, it's like coming a full circle. Our alumni come back and share their programmatic success, and then they provide a step on the ladder for their peers as um, currently in the program. So peer-to-peer -peer mentoring is very important. So our ecosystem includes faculty, scientists, alumni, our research and academic partners within business and industry. We have. Um, Donors, we were hosted. We were chosen this past uh, year to be the SUNY, 62 colleges and universities, and 30 community colleges. The first community college to host the SUNY Undergraduate Research Conference at our community college. We had over 350 researchers and um, business and industry partners to provide workshops for these students who presented their research projects. And the Schwachman Diamond Foundation chose to endow a scholarship at our community college in perpetuity so that students could be empowered for STEM as a result of that con conference. So your partnerships and your collaborations are key to your scaffolded success. So the results include that in the first cohort of the first five years of our grant, we had 29% women in that cohort. Our second five-year grant from 2011 to 2016, we had 35% women in our cohort. Our cohort that we're running right now is at 48%, so our numbers are rising, our successes are seeming to uh, encourage future, more success and in a chemical parlance, you know, when you have a seed crystal, it catalyzes in the growth of more and better opportunities. Over 90% of our graduates um, have transferred to four-year institutions and then to graduate schools to pursue their STEM ad advanced STEM degrees. We have another presentation that shows that their GPAs are much higher, their retention rates are higher, and we've empowered over 200 scholars to receive scholarships over the past uh, 10 years years with our three successive grants. Um, over 120 of those uh, young people have been student researchers and they receive paid research opportunities because when you come to a community college you have to choose between work and school. So having extra money to pursue a $5,000 10-week paid research internship where you meet uh, people who can be your transformative mentors for your entire career early on in your educational uh, career is, is transformative. I've received three texts and three emails from my students who are now at Smithsonian Institute for the summer. Mm -hmm. They're out at Argonne National Lab. They're at Oak Ridge National Lab. They're at uh, Brookhaven National Lab. Um, our research scholars have been the largest cohort in the DOE research program at BNL because, but these are for competitive uh, research internships. And over 50% of the research scholars are women at the community college. So of that, we're very proud. So I hope to tease out some nuances. I, it's a lot of information, but perhaps in questioning, I can explain later. Oh, we have, we just had a paper come out in the Council of Undergraduate Research that explains our work. Uh, up to Dr. Nave, thank you. 
You've got one. Perfect. Uh, thank good, you. good afternoon, and, and thank you all for inviting, and my pleasure to serve on the panel to talk about uh, gender equity through mentoring programs. I have the pleasure of serving as the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Prairie View a and University, and I'm also a professor of chemical engineering in the Roy G. Perry College of Engineering. Uh, Prairie View is a historically black college that's over 140 years old, located outside of Houston, Texas. We are a member of the Texas A&M University system and one of 107 uh, historically black colleges in the United States. Of those um, 107, about 11 or so have colleges or schools of engineering and so we are a small group uh, within a small group of universities um, at the in the United States. Historically black, black colleges in general were, um, they came into origination in order to educate African American students uh, post Civil War era and have remained and remained a significant contributor to educating um, African American students in particular, but all students uh, in the United States. From a STEM perspective, although a small percentage of all of the institutions in the country, we're overrepresented significantly in the number of African American students who we graduate in STEM fields and those who go on to pursue uh, PhDs. The particular aspect that um, I came and present on has to do with an advanced project that we worked on um, that focused on the colleges and women faculty in the colleges and schools of engineering at those 11 HBCUs. And one of the components was providing um, mentoring and coaching uh, opportunities for those women in order to help them um, or support their matriculation through the academic ranks and into uh, administrative ranks. Although the university City in general is a minority uh, institution. When it comes to women faculty, particularly in the STEM areas, our numbers look like um, every other university's numbers. Some of the challenges that the women experience are the same challenges that are experienced at every other institution. The differences, however, come down to the context and um, how the women experience the environment uh, that they are in. And so we, um, through the advanced project, and we had an advanced paid, which focuses on taking best practices and then tweaking them um, to apply to a different group and to a different context. Taking the sum of what we saw as best practices, and in this case, the mentoring and coaching, and really tailoring it to be um, most beneficial to the women uh, who were in uh, the institution type that we were we were looking at. From our experience, what we found is that the coaching uh, aspects tended to work better than your general uh, mentoring relationships um, because for these women um, at, at um, our institutions they're heavily teaching so they already had 12 hours uh, with them being one of uh, in many instances, the only female in their department, they carried, as you can imagine, the majority of the service responsibilities, the nurturing responsibilities, uh, but many of them had their own families. So you work from eight to five, generally speaking, at work, and then you went home and you work from five to 12 uh, when they went to bed. So having the normal just general mentoring, mentor net types of relationships did not tend to work as well uh, for those women because it just became one more thing on top of what they already was being responsible for. And as you all know, uh, in any relationship, which a mentoring relationship is, it's a give and a take. So if I don't feel like I have the time uh, to devote to nurturing that mentoring relationship, then it's not as effective or helpful as it could be. So we uh, ultimately spent our time focusing on coaching because that tended to work better. Uh, it didn't require the same level of um, relationship building as a mentor, mentee type of relationship. And it was someone who they could respect and they could stretch toward in terms of being their accountability uh, type of coach. So it's scheduled in and they helped them on specific areas in which they needed to um, advance. The other um, 
challenge that we saw with the mentoring relationship is making sure that you had someone who had a common experience and who understood your cultural context. Um, because in designing some of the mentoring programs that we looked at and what we saw, um, they did not necessarily fit with the norm or the cultural context of African-American women per se. And so um, if I take myself, I use myself as an example, I'm not going to sit around just by who I am as an African-American female in a group and just have general conversations. Um, they were more inclined for the one-on-one -on -one type of mm -hmm. conversation. So um, as I conclude, so we get to the other panelists, it, we really looked at how do we tailor what we do to not just what's in the best practice, but what fits with what the female um, faculty member is going to need and how that fits into their broader cultural context to make sure that it works and that is successful for them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the organizers and for all of you being in attendance today. My name is Guillermina Gina Nunez Mshiri. I'm a professor of anthropology. It's a very long name. I'm the professor with a very long name on campus. Um, but that represents my cultural heritage. And I teach at an institution where 79% are Mexican origin students. So we're a leading Hispanic institution that's on average 30 years ahead of the nation in terms of figuring out what works for low income, first generation students of color. So uh, recently, we've been receiving lots of national recognition. Um, my colleague Stella Quinones is accompanying me to this conference uh, these next two days to speak to what we're doing and what, what is working for us. So I will be speaking about a three-year research project that was funded by the National Science Foundation that focused primarily on qualitative research of 28 Latinas in STEM fields, mostly engineering, computer science. And then of that group, I focused on 12 of them and I introduced a methodology that I had learned about, so I'm not gonna claim it, but I, it talked about life charting as a methodology. So creating a visual chart for mapping out success and resiliency of Latinas and women in STEM, women of color in STEM. And this is a study that was done in Mexico City that found that if students had male and female parents who were professionals, then traditional gender binaries of machismo and marianismo would not stand. So we cannot continue to use these narratives as if all Latinos are oppressors and all Latinas are oppressed. They just don't work. And they tend to focus on narratives of the 1940s, 1950s of rural Mexico. The truth is is more of our society is becoming urbanized and we have professionals that are male and females. And if we're raising children, then they're gonna look at different models, right, of how to distribute the gender responsibilities and burdens and what it is to have male and female role models as professionals. So we interviewed 28 women. And we found that it's important to invest in young women's aspirations. So when uh, you introduce this young woman who wanted to be part of this conference, I think it's so important because what we found in our research is that if we invest in life experiences, educational experiences early on, we will create aspirational capital. And that is a notion that is theoretically uh, proposed by uh, Tara Yoso's work and how important it is to teach our young women to dream. And so I'm gonna share with you a short story of Amber, who at the age of eight looked up at the moon and asked her father, how do I get to the moon? So the father said, well, to get to the moon, you've gotta be a NASA engineer. And from there on, Amber started her journey to become a NASA engineer. So when NASA came to our university to recruit students, she said, I don't want your pens or your papers. I wanna be a NASA engineer. The woman was so moved that she called the recruiter and said, find me an internship for this young woman. Right, um, so I got to do uh, Amber's life chart and I realized how important it was for the role of parents to invest in children's aspirations. So ins instead of saying, there's no way you're gonna become an NASA engineer, how are you gonna get to the moon? The father said, well, yeah, if you wanna get there, you've gotta be an engineer. And the important uh, role that teachers and mentors play early on, we realize that if we invest in experiences where young women can see themselves as scientists, when they can get recognized in competitions, when they get those ribbons, they begin to invest in themselves and form their identity as future STEM majors. So by the time they get to the university, they come in saying, I'm a mechanical engineering major. I'm a chemical engineering major. You know, they come in. It doesn't happen overnight. 
So I think it's important for us in the audience to recognize that those investments have to be early on in the K through 12 system. Um, some of our students realized that they were really good at fixing computers and fixing things. And that happened oftentimes uh, up until high school. So we, these uh, live charts served as visual testimonials. They allowed us to story tell and co-construct the stories of successful women engineers through these visual charts, right? So they said, we're not in the humanities, we're not into narratives, but we can chart it out, right? So what I realized is that this was a successful tool for mapping the highs and the lows of women's academic trajectories. And in co-constructing this narrative, I asked women to name their charts. What would you gonna name your chart, right? And then tell me about those lows. And so as a mentor, I would say, here you have these huge lows. Tell me how you got up. What did you do to get back up, right? Because I'm not gonna sherry code it, you know, becoming a STEM major is not easy. So when people question what your role is in a lab or if you're there to clean up their trash, you have to say, no, I am the doctor in the lab. This is my lab. No, I am the PhD student in the lab. This is my role. I don't work here in this other role that you perceive me to be in because I'm a woman of color. Uh, so we realized that these live charts were really important in mapping out these experiences early on. So um, in the university, it's very common to use our spaces for Lego competitions, for building robotics competitions. So I remember speaking to our campus president and say, Dr. Natalicio, these Lego competitions, very good, because they show up in our life charts. They show up in our narratives. These robotics competitions, very good. Let's invest in them. We realized that women in STEM like building the houses, not necessarily playing with them. Once they were done building them, they're like, I'm done, I'm an engineer. Right? So we realized how important that was and how important competition was for solidifying that identity. And so once uh, they got into higher ed, when someone questioned whether they should belong in those labs, in those classrooms, they were not gonna have it. They're like, no, I've been an engineer. I've been good in math and science for a long time. And I've competed at the state level and I have my awards, right? So, and Ms. so-and-so and my teacher said I was really good. So, no, I'm not gonna have it. Uh, so, um, my role has been to share our research findings with principals, superintendents, parents, diversity officers, early child development specialists. Since we've done this research, I've done many, many presentations about our research funding uh, opportunities and our outcomes with the people who can create the spaces, create those competitions. I said those affinity spaces and community of practice, we've got to create them for women to see themselves as scientists. And don't expect them to come into college knowing that they're gonna be a STEM major if you have not created opportunities for them to see themselves as STEM majors. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we're just waiting for the technical equipment. <coughs> Thank you, Chris. Okay, Dr. Bergay Timoneda. Okay, thank you. Good evening to everybody. And it's really a pleasure for me being here and have the opportunity to share with you this 10 years of experience of our Women in Science Committee in Catalonia. Um, as probably most of you may know, Catalonia is an European country in the Western Mediterranean, uh, currently an autonomous region of Spain. And our main city is uh, Barcelona. We have 12 universities, and here you can see some data of our university research system. The Interuniversity Council of Catalonia is the coordinating body of the Catalan university system and of consultation and advice of the government of the Generalitat de Catalunya in matter of universities. And the Women in Science Committee is one of the 10 different committees that exists at the moment. The Women in Science Committee is responsible of developing policies of gender equality in the field of higher education and research. And the committee uh, comprises one representative of each Catalan university and seven members appointed by the minister responsible of universities. Some notable functions are advise universities on the issue of gender equality, uh, coordinate equal opportunity plans, 
all Catalan universities and research centers now have uh, uh, equal opportunity plans and promote gender mainstreaming in the curricula. Today, I want to share with you only two of the most recent uh, actions we have uh, developed. Um, and we are very excited because we have worked a lot to achieve them. And we have to say that we are very proud of our work and we have high expectations in the results. Uh, on the one hand, we have promoted an accorded system of indicators to measure the situation of women at university and research centers. And on the other hand, gender mainstreaming in the university's curricula and masters at degree level. We have worked during several months to have a, this accorded system of indicators to measure the situation of women and, and, uh, in universities and research uh, centers. The aim of these indicators is uh, to inform academic community and society of the situation of women in science, to have data, data comparable at European level, and we think that having these indicators, it's necessary to design more appropriate policies for correcting the imbalances between women and men in the science and the university area. I'm not going uh, to explain in detail the, the indicators. I'm leaving my presentation, if you are interested uh, in. Um, but uh, we have uh, um, worked uh, to accord all the, the 12 universities to accord which are the, the main indicators and to collect the data that we, and this data is going to be published. Hmm? And the second uh, action I want to, to share with you, with you um, is about promoting gender mainstreaming in the university curricula. The recent uh, Catalan Equality Act is a very progressive law. And uh, our committee has had an important role in it. On one hand, during the processing of the law, because I have been invited to speak at the Catalan Parliament uh, to give our viewers committee about the article of universities. And the law was approved on 2015. And one of the millstones promulgated by the law, and I think it's a novelty uh, in European universities, is that from now it will be mandatory that every university, when presenting a new degree to be evaluated by the Quality Agency for Accreditation, must prove how it has incorporated gender mainstreaming in the curricula. To ensure compliance of this new legal requirement and to promote this, we have invited a representative of the quality agency to be member of our committee and we have been working during uh, months uh, giving advice to the agency to start doing this work. Huh? One minute left and to conclude with two ideas. Uh, two lessons learned during these 10 years of experience of our committee. On one hand, we have learned that the mantra constantly repeated, saying that today inequality is residual in universities, men and women have the same opportunities, this is a problem of the past, huh? is still a mantra very persistent. Huh? And a good way to deny it is with data. We are convinced of that. Indicators are important because we can show with data that many barriers remain. The data are going to be published. Rectors will see the, their university compared with others at a Spanish level. And I think it, it will show also academic community and society where inequalities persist in, and can generate social awareness. And the second lesson we have learned is that the mantra, okay, uh, maybe there are some inequalities, uh, but it's only a matter of time. Uh, time will fix it. Uh, or, okay, there are some inequalities, but there are more important things to do. Uh, 
at university uh, because uh, we have to be uh, the rankings and we have to 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 have uh, a research impact and uh, this is a woman's issue mm -hmm. right? it's not uh, so so important no I think this uh, is false, huh? and uh, of course, nothing is going to change uh, sitting, uh, uh, waiting um, times uh, pass, uh, of course. To solve it, we need good laws and strong policies in favor of equality. We are convinced of it, and this is our function as committee, huh? and our main challenge for the future, huh? to convince the governing body of the universities that incorporating gender mainstreaming in the curricula, uh, it's important to improve our standards of gender equality, but not, it's not a marginal issue, but a strategic issue about quality and excellence, eh? because uh, it's an issue about uh, democracy, eh? and it's an issue about uh, justice. Eh? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I find your, your, your four talks very interesting because um, I feel they reflect very much um, what we've been talking about this afternoon. So um, this afternoon we've heard a lot about um, the top-down method of dealing with things. We talked a lot about data. Um, many, many presentation speakers said, you know, I've got data to prove that there's an issue um, because people don't believe it. And then and we talked about how the, the last speaker just before this panel session, uh, Jean-Claude Vorm said, you know, you have to reinforce it in a top-down fashion. Um, and what came throughout, it was interesting because I knew I was, I was moderating this panel throughout the day, and throughout the day, people just you know, made allusions to mentoring programs, to um, women have to look like you, you have to have role models, and you're a real reflection of all this discussion. So you have effectively this, this will of having to, you know, have indicators and have the data and prove that there's something top-down that needs to be done, but it's insufficient. You also need to have the cultural aspect which your talks represent, and it's very interesting because when I, I was preparing this um, with you in the past few weeks, I realized that, you know, there's the mentoring, but there's also the coaching. And it's not just about having a mentor and a mentee, but it's also about having a mentor that looks like you um, and a coach that really cares about you. And I, I remember I asked you, what's the difference between a mentor and a coach? Um, and the answer was the mentor, um, you know, it, it, you could have a mentor that ticks the box. As one of you, one of the previous speakers said, you know, if you don't do this properly, then you're just ticking the box. I'm not saying all mentors do that, but the coaching, you can't tick the box because the coaching is on over a long period of, of time. So there's a real commitment on behalf of the coach and on behalf of the person who's being coached um, to do that. So, so thank you very much. There's, there's one thing that I really loved um, was this idea of aspirational capital. Um, I thought that was fantastic. I, I um, in, my, in my day job, I... I I work on a completely different subject um, to STEM. I work in health and I spend my whole life hearing about the well-being capital. You're born with a well-being capital. Uh, and the idea is that you, know, you need to, to, to maintain this capital throughout. And I hadn't heard the idea of aspirational capital. Um, if anything, I think this day has been full of aspirational capital. Um, I certainly feel you know, buzzed up and, and your talk certainly um, gave that. I have tons of questions, but I'm conscious that um, we've got very little time left and I don't want to monopolize and rattle on. So I'm opening the floor to the audience. Um, do you have any questions to start this debate? Yes, thank you. The lady um, to the right. If you can put your hand up high so that you can see. Thank you. And if you can state your name and affiliation, please. Um, Mary Connolly, the University of Limerick. The drinking Irish member of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, 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 I'm just, I'm just a bit um, surprised with the findings. Um, actually, I'm not sure who made the point that um, women look for mentors that um, are role models for them, that look like them, that they connect with them. Because I've done some research in this field, and I, I don't, I don't find that. I think women want the best mentors. Some women are more comfortable with other women, but not all women want that. They really
really wanted to act as the person that was going to give them and share with them the most, um, I suppose, worthwhile information with them. So I, I'm just kind of would argue against that and I might just put it out there again. Sure. You know, how did you come to that conclusion and um, just the evidence around that? Dr. Foley? Yep. Uh, you need the microphone. There you go. You, you raise a very good point, and I think that's something that I, I didn't actually get to fully touch on here. Um, I'm working with a colleague at Stony Brook University, Benita London, and she does some research in that regard about psychosocial variables related to STEM identity and STEM career identity and self-efficacy. And that's very complicated. In other words, sometimes students don't have that metacognition of exactly who would be a good mentor, and then when they get into that environment, they encounter it, what's called a chilly academic climate. They might seek somebody who they feel is would be the best person to mentor them, or who is supposed to mentor them, their, their PhD advisor, their uh, career counselor at a community college or something, and, and that person is, is not best equipped, number one, uh, even though they may look like them or, or have the same, uh, you know, gender or, or anything. So I think that what we're trying to do programmatically in our, in our efforts is to help the students uh, find a balance as to coaching them as to how to find the best mentor for them. Yes to find the best mentor, the person who can, whether that be male or female, uh, and where that person would be located. And again, I, I alluded some to transformational research experiences. People come to the community college not with good STEM self-efficacy. It's a cultural thing, and it's also sometimes a woman thing. If they're first generation, you should be a nurse. You shouldn't be a doctor. You should. You should not aspire to get a PhD. And um, over 15 years, of, I could tell you stories and stories about, um, right now, I have a young woman who, who is graduating from Columbia University private school, received a full tuition NSF fellowship, coming from a homeschooled environment to our college in 2008 at 16 years old. She funded her education at a community college, then she leveraged that into a $30,000 Merck scholarship at the Stony Brook University, and then she got the NSF fellowship, but she didn't start out saying, I'm a young black woman in, in, that I can get a PhD. She found this along the way through mentoring, which is what this session is about, and so I totally agree. The best mentor, but this whole idea of, um, the efficacy and the domain of how to get there is something that we have to be conscious of in our mentoring of these people as well. Dr. Nave? The only thing I would, I would um, add, I think it's, it's both. Um, and what we found is best is subjective because most of the time people really don't know, the students that we work with and even some of the faculty, they have an idea, but whether or not they truly understand what is the best uh, coach for them or mentor for them can be subjective. Where the challenge really became is, you know, whether they look like them, didn't look like them, um, it, it, the the common experience and whether or not that person really understood the individual enough to be able to mentor them and help them. You can have people who, who are the same race, same gender, but still come from, one come from the East Coast and the other from the West Coast, and so that may not be the best match overall. It, it, for the particular cohort of women that we focused on, in this instance, it worked better with the coaching because whether you had the common experience or you didn't have the common experience didn't matter as much because what that person was there to do was to help you like that lay out what your aspirations were or even push you to think about aspiring for things that you hadn't previously thought about and then help you chart what that that pathway for that to be. And in the peer mentoring or other form of mentoring, it just wasn't as easy because it, got, it gets more complicated uh, when you're on the mentoring side. 
Thank you very much. We have a question from um, soon doctor to be husbands. No, what was it? Doctor soon to be husbands. Anyway, right at the front. <laughs> soon to be doctor husbands. That's what it was. So I'll say it again. Deborah husbands. Deborah husbands. <laughs> from the University of Westminster in London. Um, Thank you all for your presentations, really um, interesting. My question, um, I think to an extent has been addressed, but I'm getting a sense of a conflation of language. We're talking about mentoring and coaching almost as if they're the same things, but different depending on the context, depending on the person that's doing it, depending on what the recipient wants. Um, I'm just wondering if you could kind of tease out a little bit more what the distinction is between a coach and a mentor. And one of the reasons I ask this is because um, earlier I'd said that uh, one of my findings was that um, black students tend to um, find mentoring tokenistic. They, they stay away from it. Um, they see it as, you know, you're, you're kind of, um, you see me as a special case kind of thing. Um, so I'm wanting to know how we can move away from that uh, and get black students to engage with something that is really for the greater good. Uh, I agree. Coaching and mentoring are two different uh, concepts. Mentoring, um, I think it's more of a a relationship that you build and dialogue that person mentor you, whether that's on your professional career, your personal, but they're there to help kind of guide you through. Where a coach is really specific in terms of you all are, are identifying some particular areas that you're wanting to focus on, and then they kind of coach you, to use the word, to get to where uh, it is that you need to go. I do think depending on how the the um, scenario plays out. A coach can become your mentor. Uh, and in some cases, a mentor may end up being your coach. But they do have two distinct differences and, and purposes. Uh, to your question about how do we move students of color uh, to um, particular African Americans to see it as being more valuable, I think that one goes back um, really to K through 12, I think it's in how they're socialized uh, in until you, so you, we would have to really, really start at a very early age in changing the social, socialization of African American students or students of color and how they see um, those type of relationships, the value of the relationships, which takes you to the family structure uh, as well. And how, so it, it really would get back to kind of changing the cultural norm of that group uh, if we want to see the students value it, particularly once they get to the, um, the college level. But I, I think, you know, at the college level, we can um, share with them, but I use the old dog, new trick um, type of analogy. Once they get there, it's really hard to move them because they've been set. So all you can do is try to, to intervene, but, if, but we would really need to start much earlier in their life to, to see the change. So we, we inquired on the role of family. So fathers came up, mothers, grandparents, older siblings or cousins. But then there's the whole realm of significant others. Who were the significant others? They don't always look like you, not especially in communities of color where you don't have a lot of role models that look like you. But it was sometimes a counselor or the peer group, right? Someone ahead of you, one or two years, that can say, stay away from that class. That professor has issues, right? Take this one. Here are some strategies. So the peer groups were actually very significant for Latinas, right? Going one or two years ahead of them. So the peer, the affinity groups, we found that how critical creating the affinity groups was. Because they ha oftentimes we found also with women that they had to prove their way in. So just finding a group and say, well, you help me is not easy. They have to prove that, hey, I got an A on my exam. OK, you're good. Then we'll let you in. Or you're a gamer. Then we'll let you in. So women are constantly having to prove themselves. right? And we found that, that they constantly had to prove themselves. And in having to prove themselves, it solidified their identity. right? And once they did that, they were let in the gate. Uh, so there are these significant others, and I'm always looking for those significant others in the research and in the interviews. Who were those critical people and what did they do mm. that encouraged you to keep on going forward, that solidified your ability to see yourself as strong in mathematics and science? And, and that was it. That they, they see these people are critical, and they're not always your, you know, your 
the person you think it's gonna, it's not always the teacher. It's not always going to be the mother or the father. It's sometimes it's going to be these critical people that you find in your in your journey. So we call them as critical in the stepping others. stone process to getting to STEM careers. Dr. Timoneda, very very quickly because we're running out of time. I was just wondering, do you in your inter university council of Catalonia are, are there experiences of mentoring? Mentoring programs of coaching programs is that is that also something that that you have in your in your inter inter university council? We have we have uh, mentoring uh, uh, programs in some of our universities, not all the Catalan universities, but some of them, mm -hmm. especially the universities the, the universities with the STEM disciplines, right. and uh, the projects are um, focused on working on high schools. Projects right. in high schools to go there and to show uh, because the, the stereotype and the, the, the problem begins uh, at an early age. No, it's it's important to to act when you are in the university, but to change uh, to change the the, the mind and uh, the girls, uh, young girls. Mm, uh, it's important they don't see uh, engineering as a, a, a strange thing. Uh, or the, no, to create show, the aspirational capital that we were talking about. Of course, and show models of uh, women uh, very normal and very maybe feminine or not. I don't know, but they can be also engineering or. And this works, yes. Super. Can I please ask you, uh, we're running out of time, I'm sorry. Can I please ask you to thank our four speakers um, for this session? So a round of applause, please. <laughs> and keep your energies up because I'm going to need you to applaud three times. First of all, can I please ask you to applaud all our speakers today who kept us on time. We're finishing at quarter past six, spot on time. So a round of applause for all our speakers. A big round of applause to you, because without you, this would not have been such an extraordinary session. You've been very interactive, very sharp, and to the point in your questions. So a round of applause to the audience. And a round of applause to our organizers. First day is over. It's been a terrific success. Day two is tomorrow. It starts at nine. Um, between now and tomorrow, nine o'clock, we have a fantastic reception that awaits us. I believe it will be somewhere between where the coffee was and outside. Um, so a big round of applause to the organizers and see you at nine. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.